Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing our municipal series where we sit down with local elected officials from across our great country and talk to them about themselves, their community, and of course, their duty to serve. Today, I am pleased to welcome onto the show Deputy Mayor for the City of Fredericton in New Brunswick, but also Councillor for Ward 8 in the City of Fredericton. Please help me welcome Deputy Mayor Gregory Erickson, Deputy Mayor Erickson, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. It's great to be here. So, uh, Greg, let's get the party started with the question I've asked every single politician on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, it's uh, It's been with me a long time. Um, I've been involved in uh, politics, I think, at every level of uh, schooling that I've been involved in. Um, and it's uh, maybe growing up the second of four children, you know, helped convince me that uh, there's a lot of work to do um, to kind of preserve and help the institutions that we all rely on to run. Uh, you know, that was true of how my family was run. So lots of chores from a very early age. And I took an active role in making sure that they were assigned in a fair and equitable way among my parents' constituents. And mighty, there are only four of us. Uh, but that certainly, uh, uh, you know, conditioned my early uh, perceptions on how an individual needs to get involved in the things that are externally organizing their lives. Was politics discussed at the dinner table? Was politics discussed on a municipal, provincial, federal level? Or was it one of those things where, like most families say, don't talk about fam uh, politics and religion at the dinner table? Were you were you the exceptional family that <laughs> talked about it? Uh, yes, we were. Uh, both my parents uh, were professors. My father was a professor of English history and my mother was a professor of nursing um, and also involved in the administration of that faculty as dean. Um, so we talked about uh, all kinds of things that impacted our community around us. Um, and with respect to, you know, was the municipality ever mentioned? Um, one of the things that my uh, mother was involved in when we moved to Fredericton uh, when I was a very young boy uh, she was one of the founding members of our local heritage conservation group, Fredericton Heritage Trust. Um, and one of the first things that Fredericton Heritage Trust did uh, was sue the municipality of Fredericton for their plan at the time to uh, sell the adjacent rail beds that the Canadian National Railways was divesting itself from. And city council at the time was going to uh, give the adjacent landowners access to these properties for a really cheap rate. And Heritage Trust stepped in to sue the city and said, no, these are public lands. We should have a public conversation about how they're disposed of. Um, and through that public conversation, the city of Fredericton decided um, in a moment of wisdom and second thought to uh, make a public trail system out of them instead of ceding them to the adjacent landowners. Um, and now I find as deputy mayor, um, I'm rarely asked to bring greetings to groups that come visit the city of Fredericton where we don't take credit for our magnificent trail system and our ability to function as a community without automobiles. Wow. Yeah. So big yes to those questions, Chris. You, it sounds like you, you have a political bone in your body. It sounds like you, you grew up in a political household that talked about politics. Um, did you ever think growing up that you would be putting your name on a ballot or putting your name forward to be representing the city that you live in? Or was this something that just sort of came out of the blue in 2012 when you first put your name forward for municipal politics in that uh, municipal election in May of 2012? Oh, excellent question. Uh, I think um, I held a, a belief growing up and most of my time through uh high school and then university and then in grad school, uh, that I would best serve my community if I became a professor and developed, you know, the evidence that good decisions could be made upon. Um, and I, you know, that was following in my parents' footsteps and, uh, you know, the community that I grew up in, which is very academic. Uh, but then as I grew older um, and became more experienced, I realized that just having evidence wasn't enough. Um, that it actually came down to the uh, the work that the decision makers did, um, how they treated evidence. Um, and increasingly, I became aware of uh, biases that crept into the process uh, that kind of kept our community decisions from being the best they could be. Um, and this happened, I think, first when I got involved in uh, union politics. 
as a graduate student. Uh, I was involved in creating and certifying a collective bargaining group at the University of New Brunswick for graduate students. And then I was part of the group that helped negotiate their first two collective agreements. Wow. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, the collective bargaining table is not uh, the site of an evidence only debate. Um, and my, so I, my husband will agree with that because he is currently in a negotiation and he says <laughs> that sometimes you just have to bang your head against the table because evidence is not evidence on a table, a bargaining table. Correct. Correct. So kind of opened my mind to the, the multiplicity of other things that, uh, you know, would be bearing on decision makers. Uh, I became keenly involved, uh, you know, in studying politics, you know, at, at the grad school level and was very interested to find out that. Um, you know, the party system kind of imparts a certain kind of team-based or ideological-based uh, filter that really prevents sometimes uh, good information from coming forward. Uh, anyway, and to skip forward many years, uh, that is not a feature of the municipal system. So it re really kind of resonated with me to be kind of the best of both worlds where I could get into a decision-making capacity, help my community engage and develop better public policy um, while at the same time, same time focusing on evidence, but I wasn't going to have party people telling me which way to vote, which way to think, which way to uh, lead. So what happened in 2012? So what I'm assuming in 2011, you made the decision to run in the 2012 municipal election. But what happened then to, to make that decision uh, a reality? Because uh, decision making evidence is understandable, but you you have to then say to yourself, "I'm the best person to make those decisions to bring that evidence right. to that table." Right. So, what happened in 2011 and 2012 that made you decide, "Okay, it's time to put up or shut up"? Um, well, the simple answer is uh, we did not have a candidate in Ward Eight, Skyline Acres, uh, that was reoffering. Okay. Um, so there was a uh, kind of an open conversation in the community about, well, who's going to run now? Um, one of the people that stepped forward to run at that time was a former councillor and a former mayor of the city of Fredericton, uh, Sandy DiGiacento, um, who was uh, who was very instrumental in the city's history, uh, charting a, a very strict um, kind of within your means only approach to doing capital construction and supporting and fixing and developing new infrastructure in the city. He developed uh, and implemented as a uh, councillor and then as mayor a, a pay-as-you-go system for development. It would keep you out of trouble um, if you, uh, you know, were faced with terrible interest rates in the marketplace all of a sudden and so on and so forth. As long as you stay within your means, you know, you're fine. Um, anyway, that worked great, uh, especially around the 2008 financial crisis and, you know, when the marketplace is in tremendous period of upheaval. Um, but I thought it was very limiting. So I wasn't really uh, all that entertained with the idea of him coming in to represent uh, my household um, as our local constituent. I thought to myself, uh, you know, there's a better way to do things and a more modern way to do things. Um, and, uh, and so I stepped forward to run, uh, you know, without the experience, but with a little energy and some enthusiasm. Um, you know, knowing that a lot of what he had done was already kind of baked into the system to some extent. But I thought I'd give it a run, um, and the community gave me uh, its support. I want to go to that election period because going around and knocking on people's doors and asking for their vote is a unique entity, especially in municipal politics, because a, a local government, I should say, because you're mm -hmm. not running, like you said, in under a party system. You're running as your own person. Did that right. give you leeway to talk about the issues that were important to the people of Fredericton, particularly Ward 8? Because when I spoke to MPs and MPPs, MLAs, they always say, you talk about the issues that are on the platform. But as a local mm -hmm. councillor, you get the leeway to talk about the issues that are important to the people that is on door one, two, and three. And it's not always issue one, two, and three. It's issue one, eight, 12, and you have to deal with the issues that are coming. Did you enjoy that process of talking about the issues that were important to the people? Because it seems like you're a very uh, informed guy and it seems like you know what you need to talk about. And I can imagine being sort of a relatively newcomer to politics in 2012, when you got to the doors, you may not have expected to hear what you heard. Yeah, you, uh, you hit the nail right in the head. Um, 
In fact, the first question that I was asked uh, in my first canvas um, just stopped me dead in my tracks. Um, I was asked by a very well-informed, very well-meaning uh, elderly constituent um, what my position on supporting the Ukraine was in 2012. <laughs> in in um, 2012? And, in 2012, yeah. And it's interesting. So at that time, uh, the Canadian Federation of Municipalities, uh, which does a lot of international outreach, um, sharing uh, best practices, experience in municipal governance, um, including uh, participation from current municipal elected officials. And the Fredericton's uh, mayor at that time, Brad Woodside, was the vice president of the Canadian Federation of Municipalities and had just gone on a, a kind of a fact-finding trip and a, a political trip to the Ukraine uh, just to help support their communities with better kind of national municipal level integration and those kind of policies. So it had been in the paper. Um, and I got that question and it started a great conversation. And you're right. She, she asked a whole variety of questions, um, not all of them within the kind of direct legislated mandate of a municipality. Um, but I learned something that day, uh, probably quite a few things. But one of them, of course, was that uh, um, as your neighbors, um, and in this case, you know, a municipal politician should refer to their constituents as neighbors. Um, you know, as your neighbors are asking you about um, things that matter to them, part of your role is to help uh, frame the issues that they're interested in, in terms of who the representatives are. Uh, so when in our conversation about the Ukraine, um, you know, I asked uh, this, this neighbor if she had uh, reached out to her MP, if she had reached out to her MLA and uh, taken um, their level and uh, of jurisdiction into consideration when she was, uh, you know, willing to advocate for a better and more robust relationship with the Ukraine, um, and she hadn't. And uh, so my first question led to my first kind of, kind of co-advocacy uh, role. And I realized that's something that uh, municipal politicians, you know, because with the lowest level of government, we spend a lot of time looking up and knowing where the other actors are. Um, and often we help uh, communities reach out uh, to their other level of government representatives in order to, you know, better express their interests in the policy that's coming from those levels. Um, and when you get to issues of affordable housing, homelessness, uh, substance abuse, mental health issues in the community, um, you know, there are facets of all of those uh, tremendous social challenges that exist in each level of government. Um, and I became very, very aware of the need to uh, better connect uh, both the constituents you know, my neighbors to these people, but also these representatives back to the community. I want to pick up on something that you just mentioned, and it's about the whole idea that we, we a municipal local government officials have to stop looking at the constituents as constituents, but more as their neighbors. You were the first person who I've interviewed through my time doing this show, uh, whether it be local uh, elected officials or even provincial, who said that. And I find that fascinating because it's true. They're not the people that are your constituents. They are literally your neighbors. They're the people Absolutely. that you were there to represent on a day-to-day -day basis. Why is it so important for local government officials to look at it through that lens instead of the lens of a constituent? Uh, well, my opinion um, is that uh, the the healthiest community um, engages uh, its members uh, that, uh, in, in the best possible way. Um, and part of that engagement, because uh, so it, and we do this because we rely on them. Um, I so is this, people, a, is this a city of Fredericton uh, sort of mantra that they're not your constituency? Because again, you're the first uh, elected official who said this. So um, is this all of Fredericton? Like if I talk to Counselor for Ward 4 or 3, would they say the same thing? Um, they may not, but you might be able to uh, um, kind of divine it from our uh, our emphasis on public engagement and uh, how we do communications um, and how we how we choose to, um, you know, make the decisions to, um, you know, go back to the community on issues. Um, you know, and I say to people all the time, um, the city of Fredericton, um, you know, we'll build a hockey arena um, and we'll make sure we keep the lights on and the ice cold and hard and, you know, properly treated. Uh, but the city of Fredericton um, 
hasn't once paid or hired a referee to ref a hockey game or coach to run a team. And we don't organize a team and stuff. So we do this in partnership with the community groups that kind of populate the public spaces because municipal governments do two things uh, well and very well because we're kind of designed this way. And, and uh, that is to build and maintain infrastructure um, and also to uh, plan both uh, financially and socially over time. And that includes things like borrowing money. Um, we can borrow money cheaper than private citizens, cheaper than uh, the private sector uh, over time. And when coupled properly with uh, the kind of infrastructure maintenance that uh, municipalities required, um, you know, that's the, that's the strength of a municipality. And both of those things get even better when the community is uh, more deeply engaged and your community and when and when your community is doing things that, uh, you know, your neighbors really want and really reflect uh, the kind of community that they, they want to live in. Um, and so, so that's kind of the mantra uh, that I operate under. Um, and a bunch of my council colleagues uh, operate under similar mantras, but we might disagree on how it's phrased. I, 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 I'm, I love these conversations because I'm finding so much about these great communities, but also great counselors like yourself, because I would never have thought to think of constituents as neighbors, but I always ask my guests, how do you balance what your neighbors need against what the city needs? Because you're there to represent mm -hmm. uh, in Fredericton, it's at a ward uh, base. So you're there to represent the people of Ward 8, but you also have to represent the city as well and do the best for the city. So that's right. When you, when you talk about communications, that's a key factor in a lot of these conversations that I'm having is how do you communicate with your neighbors to say, I would love to deal with some issues that are in Ward 8 right now, but Ward 8 isn't the worst in the city. Ward 3 might be. I'm just picking a random ward. I'm not jumping on Ward 3 at all. I'm just saying, <laughs> how do you balance the needs of your res your neighbors in Ward 8 against the neighbors of your city? Um. Well, carefully, <laughs> uh, because those things, things do sit in opposition. Um, in <laughs> fact, uh, your, your first moment on council would be to swear an oath, your oath of office, which asks you to be the steward of the citizens' interests as Fredericton as a whole. Um, so we, um, we know from moment one uh, that we are counselors there to represent the values of our constituents, you know, writ large over the whole city. Um, and so it, it, but it does come into conflict. Um, anyone that's ever tried to cite a, uh, a dump in their community uh, knows full well of the complications involved because, uh, you know, no small group of neighborhoods is ever going to want a dump in their backyard. Um, yet communities need landfills uh, in order to function. Um, so there's, there is that tension that's built in and, uh, um, at the municipal level, it's interesting how that plays out. Um, I do you think, don't think it's any beneficial? Councilor would, do you think it's beneficial um, that the, the mindset of a councillor has to be on the city while understanding that you have to represent your neighbors in your ward as well? Because when you're in budget deliberations, you're battling it out for what money goes where. And you guys can, absolutely. I, I've been on, I've been in municipal budget uh, deliberations and some people get very touchy when they want a, a ice rink or an upgrade to a park, but you have to look at it as an entire city. Is it beneficial for the city to look at the city as a whole and not eight different communities or 10 different communities, depending on how many wards you have? Um, I'm going to say yes, but there's a there's a pretty intense caveat that comes comes with it. Um, so the city of Fredericton, in order to kind of balance the needs of the many against the needs of the few or even the individual, um, we okay, have a Spock. really robust. Yeah, I know. <laughs> happy to happy to make the sci-fi references whenever possible. Um, we have a very robust standing committee system, um, and our objective is to create public policy. Uh, that reflects the interests of the many um, and reduce the uh, obligations of the few or the burden, you know, of the few. Um, and if city uh, political representatives, you know, our council and mayor, if we do our job right, and then the bureaucracy, city staff do their job right by bringing us forward 
evidence-based uh, considerations under those policies, um, then uh, the promise we can make to our constituents is that uh, your needs as you've identified them will be attended to um, in a very uh, transparent and triaged way where you will also be the judge of, you know, uh, of how we're doing because you'll see the development of our public policy. And we ask you to take a moment to be empathetic and say, uh, um, knowing that we're going to get around to how the issue manifests in your backyard, let's take care of your neighbors who are suffering more first. Um, and generally that is a very strong place to offer leadership from. Um, are you people, have to stick to the end. You are have people to stick to your open? guns and you have to be transparent. Um, well, I'm not going to say this is a, a you know, panacea to all the uh, multiple perspectives that come out of the neighborhood. There are some people that want what they want now, and there's just no um, convincing them otherwise. Um, but people do know. They make trade-offs every day in their real lives um, against uh, um, other issues and then other people with the same issues at different levels of intensity. So, so it's a very familiar space to be in, you know, that kind of social negotiation without saying no, right? Um, and I can tell you uh, many stories on how this has played out locally. Um, we're currently uh, reformulating the policy that governs uh, neighborhood traffic calming in the city of Fredericton. One of the things that we found was that our citizens didn't have adequate access to traffic uh, data. And so they had a really hard time assessing, you know, the kind of safety of their own neighborhoods and the safety of their own lived experience relative to other parts of the city. And then they didn't see what the city's uh, response, uh, built response and also service response through police was to keeping traffic uh, decent in their neighborhoods, because that data was also not transparent enough. So we're reformulating how we do neighborhood traffic calming by uh, leaning more heavily on making the data and the policies that make these decisions very accessible to the neighborhoods so that they can then see, okay, I feel my neighborhood's not safe, but it is demonstrably at least 20th in the list. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to uh, be patient when it comes to and ask that will create a safer environment, or maybe it just helps contextualize the environment in the first place, so that the lived experiences, you know, could be seen for what they are, as opposed to how they're felt by the constituent. Because you know, you, the bus goes by you at forty kilometers an hour, big objects. That's scary. It might make you feel, you know, unsafe, but it did just go by you at forty kilometers an hour. Mm -hmm. So Lots of things. You, you, you've you opened up a little bit of a Pandora's box for me because I like talking about mm -hmm. communications and I love communications as a former communications person for a municipality. You can you can present the data. You can present the data of the, the, the crime statistics, the traffic statistics. Mm -hmm. But if the resident doesn't read it and the resident doesn't get it, they won't look at it. You can put it out, you can mail it out, you can put it on Facebook, you can put it on the website, but unless the residents read it, they won't know. And I know right. you can plaster it out to everyone, you can go drop it off at every door, and some people just won't get it. How do you deal with that scenario? Because communication is a big thing in local government because you want to communicate the best information possible to the community. But if the community is not listening and they don't want to go to it unless it's literally put in their face and told to them 12 times, you're going to be banging your head against the wall. So how do you communicate with people to your neighbors, I apologize, mm -hmm. while understanding that you can't spend a year trying to communicate with everyone to make them happy because that's going to slow down the process of growing and moving your city forward? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we got elected to make decisions um, mm -hmm. and many of those decisions uh, are required on a pretty strict and calendarized timetable uh, to make sure people get paid, make sure your garbage gets picked up, make sure your water gets treated uh, both before and after so that the environment doesn't suffer. You know, like things like that have to happen on a schedule. So it's an excellent question. And I can remember asking uh, one of our chiefs of police that very same question, you know, and her answer I thought was fantastic because you know, we've all heard the saying, uh, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So I said, how do you make the, the horse drink? And she said, well, 
helps if you feed the horse a handful of salt first. And anyway, that got me thinking. Uh, and that might work with horses and uh, livestock. There's salt licks and fields and so on and so forth that might have that purpose. Uh, however, it doesn't work with people. Um, and to be honest, the only solution I've found is just to be consistent and persistent um, in your relying on good information and having good conversations that are adequately informed. Um, and also to make sure that when you don't have good information, and the conditions aren't right to make an appropriate decision that you pump the brakes, right? That you uh, make sure that uh, you don't unnecessarily rush into making a decision. So some decisions in the city of Fredericton, we're undergoing right now a, a heritage services program in review. And heritage is a real challenge for uh, municipalities um, because it asks us to preserve some private property and make it more difficult for or an individual to do what they want with their private property because we want it preserved for the heritage architectural features or social or political uh, heritage features. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a government limit on private properties. So we're fighting against one of the stronger institutions in Western society. We got to have good reasons for it. Well, part of our developing a heritage, a new heritage program for the city, um, it's involved hiring a consultant and doing numerous public information sessions where we all get together and not to share our own opinions, but the challenges that we're facing um, and you know what the various things are that the community can contribute to address those challenges. Um, and we go to these public uh, moments of consultation in order to uh, understand what our political license is to some extent. Um, our job right, is to reflect the community's values on public policy and make choices within the various tools available in public policy to reflect those community values. We need to spend time with the community. We also need to spend time with the community as it reacts to the options and considers the options. So these kind of public moments where we um, talk about improving services um, and the challenges that we face are super important to happen in the public domain. Um, and they can't just happen inside the confines of a um, city council meeting you know, run through Borno's rules of order, uh, because those are those are very limiting moments. How do you make a good decision when your neighbors all have a different opinion on what a good decision is? Because they've elected you, they've elected your city council to represent them. But I guarantee you, if I go talk to your community of Ward 8, and I go speak to 100 people in Ward 8 right now, they will all give me their best, their good direction of where the city of Fredericton should move. How do you, as their elected official, as their councillor, as their deputy mayor, gather that information and then you make that best decision that will best move the city forward, but also your ward forward as well well chris it's it's uh it's challenging for sure um but is it though things... is it challenging well, because you have to at the end of the day you're there to make the decision like mm -hmm. you have to stand by your decision good bad or indifferent is it that right. hard well i mean the the decision making framework in in some sense is right. It's not hard because you know if you wait for the public meeting the council meeting where the decision comes forward, you know you can hold your breath for an hour and a half. It'll be over. The news cycle will refresh refresh in a day or two, and you'll be on to something else. Okay. So so one element of it isn't hard, but the question I, I ask myself is, uh, you know, have we done the best thing for the community? And you know, has uh, our decision making process uh, lost an opportunity that we should have taken advantage of? Um, and in many cases, especially in a case where we make a decision, um, if we're constrained because of time um, or we haven't gotten a, a decent consultation out of the community, you know, we still have to make the decision anyway, periodically. Um, but I'll say to people, uh, and I, I say to people this all the time, I said that, you know, the bylaws and the resolutions that city council passes to us are written in pencil. Right. We can go back and amend and we can change. Um, and I find responsible uh, municipal governments understand that kind of iterative nature of the policy they deal with and are willing to make changes. Um, Have you reflect, gone you know, into a council meeting? Have you ever gone into a council meeting with a mindset of, OK, this is how I think it's going to be presented. I think I'm going to vote this way and then heard a public hearing go, oh, I didn't think that. And now my mind's going to change. Or are you. Uh, 
in cement when you have made up your mind when it comes to issues around bylaws, around garbage changes? Is there flexibility that you see yourself where you're able to change on a moment's notice on the new information that's presented to you, the new evidence that's presented to you? Um, I like to think that I'm in those footsteps as you've described them. Uh, I think I've voted for virtually every uh, tabling motion that's come in front of council uh, when it's based on you know, council legitimately saying, I think I need more information to make a better vote. I think we need to hear from more staff. I think we need to hear from more of the external stakeholder groups. Um, you know, all that in the context of if it's possible to slow a decision down to make one that engages better, um, I'm all for that. Uh, however, we're not always in a position where we can make that uh, kind of pause in our own deliberations, um, sometimes in part due to the necessities of you know, following a municipal calendar, you know, for budget purposes. Sometimes it's uh, because our kind of intergovernmental uh, relationship with either the province or the feds requires us to move at a certain speed. Um, but this gets back to the point uh, that we were talking about earlier. So when I'm dealing with constituents that uh, are looking at me and saying, hey, that last decision you made, um, you know, we're not entirely happy with that. You know, we want it reversed. Uh, that's fine. I'm more than willing to have those conversations because what I want to do is I want to maintain uh, a connection to that group. Like I want to help amplify their voice, help their advocacy. If they care about something in our community, I want them to keep caring about it and be more effective about how they articulate that. Um, and it, it's not an all or nothing game. Like I don't want them to feel that, you know, just because the decision didn't go their way that I won't be there to help connect them to other levels of government, other people in the community that might feel that way, or even other uh, uh, issues that they may be way more successful with. Um, so it's uh, it's all about managing relationships um, in a very real way. Um, and this is something that I find very different from the um, party politics is that an idea coming before council, you know, no one cares if the person presenting it was wearing a blue shirt or a red shirt or a green shirt. You know, the question is all, um, you know, when you do a cost benefit analysis of this decision, is it in the interest of our constituents? Um, and if the interest is, uh, you know, remote and small, you know, it's going to be challenging to make a good argument to support it. Um, however, if the interest is, uh, you know, immediate and large, you know, that makes for very easy decisions. I want to turn to one last thing before we move on to our segment two, which is the city of Fredericton. And I want to ask about the balance that you have in your life, because you are a municipal uh, deputy mayor. You, I'm assuming this is not a full-time job uh, like many municipalities across Canada. Some are, some are not. Um, but you are there 24 seven representing the city of Fredericton. Mm -hmm. So if you go out with your family, you are, Deputy Mayor, you are not uh, uh, Gregor. You're not Gregory. You're Deputy Mayor Erickson. Wherever yeah. you go, how do you balance that? How do you balance the needs of interacting with your community, but also the needs of your downtime, your personal life? Because I can imagine after the, so long in uh, public office since 2012, not too long, but 10 years in public office, you must have found a balance to say, okay. I'm I'm Greg today. I'm deputy mayor to tomorrow. How do you balance that? Um, well, the easiest uh, thing in my case um, is that uh, uh, my partner and I, uh, I'm married. Uh, my wife, Nicole O'Byrne, is a professor at the University of New Brunswick Law School. Um, I would say uh, neither of us have a traditionally balanced life. Um, we don't have kids. Um, I don't have any uh, nieces and nephews that are, uh, you know, of an age or even local uh, that require a lot of my time. Um, so as just like she has doubled down into her uh, profession, um, you know, on the research and teaching and service and so on and so forth. Um, I've done that as well on uh, my side. Um, now, you brought up, uh, you know, whether it's full time or part time and so on and so forth. Uh, tradition of municipal governance in Fredericton council positions are part-time. However, I've been pursuing it full-time since I got elected uh, because I really do believe that uh, to do your job in the best possible way, you need to put in full-time hours. 
Um, so you need to spend a lot of time meeting with uh, stakeholders uh, that are relevant to the decisions you make. Um, and that takes a lot of time. And uh, Fredericton is a very engaged community. Is um, it? Our civil society. Uh, yeah, we've got one of the most engaged uh, chambers of commerce, for example, in Canada. Uh, they punch way above their weight. Um, and in fact, uh, at, at every municipal election, one of the things that you'll see um, come out of their website and their communications, but also get reflected in the uh, local papers, um, is a program uh, they call, I think, Every Question Matters. And they put surveys to all the uh, potential candidates for municipal office. Um, and it's the only space where you see really hard questions get asked in detail and answered in detail. Um, and to see, uh, you know, one of our civic society groups coming forward and providing that tremendously valuable service. And it's, remember, it's not the media doing this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a civic society group and they're, uh, they understand the value of it. Um, and they don't just ask questions about uh, economics and small business. You know, they're asking questions about the hard social issues that have uh, either happened in the last mandate or they foresee happening in the next. Um, and, uh, you know, are pursuing a, Actually, I've been doing it for 20 years now, if a day. Um, and these are the kind of things that, uh, you know, you need to be able to uh, reach out and know the people at the chamber in order to have a decent conversation. with. Um, we've recently had through council in the city of Fredericton uh, resolution supporting a basic income guarantee. Uh, that is well outside the municipal uh, framework of responsibilities. Um, it's deep in the heart of provincial and federal uh, political jurisdiction for sure. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, the Council City of Fredericton uh, passed a resolution asking the mayor to write a letter to our provincial and federal colleagues, asking them to uh, give due consideration at their level of government, a basic income guarantee because of its potential to lessen the impacts on income insecurity, housing insecurity, food insecurity, all these other things that our constituents and neighbors are feeling in the city of Fredericton. You know, so we're well off the page when it came to um, our own jurisdiction, but got to make a decent conversation, um, especially a decent decision on this matter, especially after we consulted with a lot of stakeholders in the Fredericton area. Um, and interestingly, on the case of the chamber, uh, they were not necessarily in favor of that distinction or that basic income guarantee resolution because the way they looked at it was that it was just going to be an increase in tax load um, and the province and the feds were going to if they chose to do something like this would just increase the tax burden on small business and that wasn't something they were interested in so we had to sit down with the chamber and uh, go over why they believed that go over the evidence we found that might have either supported or shown a contrary position um, and we're still having that conversation actually um, even though council passed a resolution supporting um, a basic guaranteed income advocacy position towards the other levels of government. Um, anyway, I, I cherish the relationships that I have with the other uh, civic society groups. Um, and they're, they're not all in the traditional format of uh, the Chamber of Commerce, um, but they all definitely have an advocacy interest that makes sense to them at the municipal, provincial, and federal level. Um, so properly engaged, you know, they're my neighbors. I want to know what they think. I, th I think a lot of counselors who might be listening to this are jealous that they're, you, you have a very engaged community. Uh, I know there are some others that are engaged, but to hear that uh, the Chamber of Commerce does that on a, on a, an election basis where they will email a list of questions to all the counselors or to the council candidates is mm. kind of surprising, but also I'm kind of jealous because I wish we had that out here in Alberta. So yeah, it's, it's totally awesome, right? Yeah. Um, um, so I want to turn to my next segment, and that's yeah. that is the city of Fredericton as a whole. And before I ask this question, I want to preface this because we seem to get a lot of emails whenever we ask this question to counselors. This is a question. This is a conversation between the deputy mayor and myself. This is not a direction at council. This is not a decision of council. This is a just an opinion that he has, and he's talking to me, the host. So, Deputy Mayor Erickson, my question to you is this: In your opinion. What is the biggest issue today facing the city of Fredericton? Hmm. Um, I think our greatest challenge uh, right now um, is to uh, create a community that has uh, an affordable 
profile um, and uh, and a livable reality for our constituents, for our neighbors. Um, I've been on council long enough uh, now to expect every year when we come to consider our budget, uh, you know, annual cost of living increases and so on and so forth. Um, and sadly, uh, you know, this often means increasing the amount of revenue that the city requires, which increases property tax. Um, well, our, our duty is not to uh, uh, make sure the city is uh, um, flush in money. Our duty is to make sure that we provide services um, and infrastructure that's reliable and kind of meets the, the vision of its constituents. Um, and our challenge right now is that the city's costs are rising much faster than uh, our ability to increase revenues and still maintain an affordable community. Um, and we've seen this coming out of COVID. There have been all kinds of disruptions to uh, supply and demand chains and grocery prices are crazy, fuel prices have been crazy and so on and so forth. Uh, but in none of that uh, public outcry about those prices and the affordability, did we ever hear anyone say, well, that's all right. We could deal with one less snow plowing. We'll just, you know, let you guys skip some of your service provision in order to keep taxes down. Well, that just won't ever happen. You know, we need to police our community 24 seven, make sure the road networks are clear 24 seven and so on and so forth. Um, and so the, the real challenge to us is, you know, how do we make our uh, community affordable while still time taking advantage of the things that municipal governments do well, like financial planning. As a city councilor, as a resident of the city of Fredericton, I wanna see the city spend money in a way that takes advantage of prevention uh, wherever possible, whether it's social service or uh, maintaining infrastructure, because it's way cheaper to deal with preventative spending than it is to wait for something to fail and then have to deal with the uh, expensive catastrophic impacts of a failure, you know, whether it's, you know, a storm line breaking and flooding properties or whether it's uh, someone uh, experiencing terrible income and housing insecurity and ending up uh, homeless and having to go through, you know, that part of the public system. Because those are all failures and they're expensive. And if we do our best to focus on you know, spending upstream, spending in a preventative way. You can get away with spending less, keep your community affordable, but also realize the vision of the people, you know, that are your neighbors and create the community that they want to live in. So, so that's the challenge is balancing all those things. So quick, quick question, just a clarification from my part. When does the mm -hmm. province of uh, New Brunswick's uh, municipalities do budget deliberations? Is it early spring or is it late fall? Uh, it's late fall. Late fall. So you've gone through yeah. your budget deliberations for 2023 already in the city of Fredericton then? Yeah, we tie them up uh, basically early December. Okay. Um, and that lets us, uh, and then the provincial course budget process starts just after the new year. Which is always so, confusing for, to me, but anyway, here we are. Um, I, because I want to ask this question, because the cost of living is going up. You and I will both agree to that right here, right now. You are mm -hmm. saying the biggest issue that is facing Fredericton is affordability. People are struggling right now. People are struggling across this country, and I'm assuming in Fredericton as well. How do you go to your residents, say, okay, we are increasing your taxes 3% because the cost of living, because if we go 0%, services are going to have to be cut back yep. because of cost of living. How do you tell people that we have to raise your taxes in a tough economic time and sell that where it sounds like it's a good thing, because anytime you try to sell someone, it's a tax increase. They will look at you and say, well, you can cut this, this, and this, and it's all going to be better. And you can save that 3% and go make it 0%. So how do you have to sell the budget to the people, your neighbors in a positive manner while telling them, well, sorry, you're going to have to pay a little bit more. Well, that's the that's the challenge, right? But have um, you found a yeah, way to do, do it? Because you've done it for so long. Have you found, or are are the people who are just going to be angry are going to have to be angry? Um, I I never try to put myself uh, in a position where I have to talk someone out of their anger. Like by the time someone's angry, um, they don't need a rational argument to pivot around. Like they need some space. Um, 
but uh, uh, but before you get to that angry point, um, I think everyone recognizes, you know, uh, that if the cost of living goes up, you know, the taxes kind of have to match, and they want to know uh, that it's being done responsibly, and they want to have access to the kind of information that you're looking at, um, because they want to know if they should have faith in your decision making powers. They don't doubt that you have to make hard decisions where competing interests are at play, um, and you know. Uh, that would be a very challenging, uh, you know, position to be in. So, when it comes to um, the cost of living piece in this last round of budget uh, deliberations, um, we had to take some time to show that, uh, yeah, the cost of living was changing, but it's changing worse for the municipality because uh, you might only have, uh, and I'll, I'll make up some numbers for the sake of a clear argument. Um, if your annual household budget spent 10% of its annual income on fuel. Um, and fuel went up a little bit, you know, you'd experience that proportional increase in the cost of your household. Well, if fuel is 30% of your expenses and it went up the same amount, like it triples the amount of impact on your budget. And so the basket of goods that a household might have um, isn't the same as the basket of goods that a municipality needs to purchase. And it's been the case in the last three or four budgets that the things in the municipality's basket of goods have gone up more than the recent cost of living. So we've been in a case uh, a couple of years now where at the beginning of the budget season, we would have to increase taxes more than the just cost of living to keep pace with services. So what do you do in that case? Um, and luckily, we've never. Is, is that because of COVID? Case. Is that because of COVID or is there other uh, it's, it's a variety of things? Okay. Um, you know, like uh, COVID didn't, uh, well, the war in Ukraine caused more of an impact on fuel yeah. than COVID did. Um, but a lot service of things, levels though, like uh, I'm assuming the pool had to be shut down during COVID, the oh, rec center, all the arenas, so, but the you libraries. still have to pay for the heat though, the power and all that. Yep. So absolutely. Um, but luckily, uh, you know, those expenses are, are small and manageable and, um, you know, that, that wasn't our real challenge. The real challenge is, you know, how do we maintain uh, our infrastructure and the road network and a lot of this kind of stuff? These expenses keep rising out of sync with the household basket of goods. Um, and it's been a real challenge. And so we spent a lot of time um, in between budgets uh, working at the policy level and with city staff to try to figure out uh, more effective and efficient ways to do what we do. Um, in order to drive down the expense of them while still delivering a fairly high level of service. Um, because we want to put ourselves in a position where we can say to our constituents, um, you know, we're, we're running an operation that's very efficient. The increases are literally to maintain the same service levels. So which streets don't you want plowed? You know, like, how do you want the reduction in service to look like if we're going to actually um, like lower taxes to the point where it challenges services? Um, when you get into those service conversations, you're right. The first thing people come forward with is a list of things they don't participate in. So it's like, I've never gone to your performing arts center. So, you know, sell the performing arts center and we'll be right back on track. And then it's council's job to, you know, weigh all these many things um, and these competing interests and come up with an appropriate decision that steers a, an appropriate middle course through all that. Um, and and that, is, that is the challenge of municipal budgeting for sure. Do you think the city of Fredericton's on a good footing in 2023? Because we are at the beginning of 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, this episode is going to be airing in February. Uh, as of recording, would you say the city of Fredericton is on good footing to help address some of the affordability issues that you've talked about in this segment already? Um, yes, I do. Um, I think uh, the city's taken some... Uh, some real bold steps um, to make sure that we keep a good eye on affordability. Um, and one of the things that we're doing, um, specifically on the housing affordability side of things, is we've uh, we've hired a, a community planning expert with an expertise in uh, housing affordability um, to create a kind of affordability or housing office inside the city um, to help work with our development community um, and the community of uh, housing and affordability advocates um, to, uh, you know, better communicate and also better leverage the other level of government's opportunities for funding 
uh, for housing and for the kind of things that can help drive down the cost of development so that we can have more development and address, you know, affordable housing. Um, and so, you know, we take a, a, a little bit of leadership can go a long way um, if it's properly positioned. Um, and sometimes it's just people, uh, you know, aren't talking with each other or, you know, there isn't, uh, you know, a culture of engagement that is really up to the task of the challenge of whatever the policy situation is going to be. Um, and so the city's uh, reaction to, you know, housing affordability is to, it has, is going to be for 2023 to see this office stood up and to get them plugged into, um, you know, our federal and provincial uh um, you know, the bureaucracies and the groups that are doing housing and housing subsidies to make sure that the city of Fredericton is both applying for all the grants that are possible um, and then developing with as few of the uh, avoidable costs as we can. Um, and that's uh, that's something I'm proud of. Um, I think the city of Fredericton, one of the things that uh, we say during our budget process is, uh, you know, in addition to, um, you know, this money that we're getting from the community, um, you know, city staff also spend an extraordinary amount of time talking to our MLAs and the MPs and the members of provincial and federal bureaucracy about the funding programs that they have on offer. Uh, because one of the other areas of value we can deliver to the uh, citizens um, is by getting funding from other levels of government to help uh, support the buying power of our municipal dollars. Um, so I think this year, you know, we have about $125 million dollar uh, general fund budget in the city of Fredericton. Um, we're applying for over $90 million of uh, grants at various levels of government. And you know, we're not going to be successful on all of those things. Uh, no municipality is. And if you have an interviewee that can share some tips on how to be more successful getting at the level of government grants, I will watch that repeatedly. <laughs> um, nevertheless, uh, you know, getting some of those other level of grants means that, uh, you know, for example, when we're dealing with climate change mitigation and adaptation, if we can spend uh, resident tax dollars at a rate that uh, means that, uh, you know, uh, we're getting like 30 cent dollars because we get an equal contribution from the province and the feds, then, uh, you know, my neighbor's tax dollars are going to go a lot farther. They're going to capture a lot more value and we're going to be able to deliver a lot more. So a little bit of leadership in those contexts can really increase the value of these things. Um, and it's, uh, it's fun to have those conversations with the community. We, you know, you see a funding announcement, a lot of those things, uh, you know, don't get a lot of press play and so on and so forth. But when I can connect for my neighbors, you know, how a federal funding announcement here and a provincial funding announcement here was leveraged by a nonprofit in the city through a little, you know, support and a little leadership from the city council, um, then they see how, oh, wow, their whole governance system is actually working, it's actually delivering some value through cooperation and collaboration. Um, and that helps keep people engaged too. Going back to the budget part of the story, and I know we're talking about affordability, but I want to talk about the budget a little bit for like mm -hmm. one last question before we move on to the last segment is municipalities have to run balanced budgets. They can't run to deficits. I talk to residents, neighbors across this country, and I've been to different communities and I've asked them the same question do you know your community can't run a deficit? And they go, what do you mean? They always run a deficit. They borrow against our, the future and all that. Do, do people understand that when you're doing a budget, or do, do your neighbors, I should say, understand that when the city of Fredericton is doing a budget, it has to equal zero at the end of the day. There is no... Right. There is no uh, like idea where you have like a $40 deficit. It has to be zero at the end of the day. So you have to use utilize the money that you get in a proper fashion to make sure that you are not spending more than you have and when it comes to the revenue that you get uh yeah it's challenging uh you know the number of constituents i know that can explain back to me uh how a municipality ought to use a second year previous surplus um defines probably the smallest group of constituents that there is <laughs> uh nonetheless i think you've uh, done a great job explaining that reality. Um, and uh, in the city of Fredericton, we do borrow money. Um, that's one of the things that uh, municipal and all levels of government do best, right? Because we're not in the private market, you know, of uh, borrowing. You're borrowing uh, cheaper. Yeah. Um, that being the case, uh, you know, the city of Fredericton's uh, budgetary guidelines are uh, 
uh, or provincial statutes. Um, and we have to follow them very clearly. In fact, we can't make loan payments that represent uh, more than 20% of our general fund budget. Right? That's just in the legislation and it's a hard cap. And uh, some communities find themselves you know, at that hard cap because they borrow the maximum amount every year because they're spending it on, um, in my opinion, things that they ought not to be spending borrowed money on. Um, now, the city of Fredericton, we've got a debt policy that's, uh, uh, I, I'm not going to say it's unique in Canada, but it's, uh, it's relatively unique in the New Brunswick experience. Um, we refuse as a council to uh, borrow more than 8%. Um, so we're at, you know, less, I'm not going to go into percentages here. So, uh, but every year, what we do is we uh, take out of our budget a payment that would be equivalent to an 8% borrow. Um, and we use that to um, pay ahead on the borrowing that we've done um, if we're not actually in fact at 8%. Like right now, I think we've borrowed uh, money to build you know, arenas and some buildings and a fire station, a variety of things. Uh, that whole basket of goods is, uh, uh, in terms of its equity on our balance sheet, I think is only about 5% um, of a potential 20%. There's a lot of room there where we could borrow more. Um, and what we say to our council is that, uh, that your projects, uh, the things that you get elected to do in terms of mandate that are small, uh, you can only do um, with money that comes from... Uh, the debt policy, so the under over. So right now at 5%, that means we've got 3% room. Annually, that turns into um, a conversation during our budget of we've got 3% of our total budget, about $3 million to work on council projects. And so we create a little operating space that's dependent on good financial management and decision-making. So our dessert for sticking to our guns and, uh, you know, making sure that our debt policy is responsible and that it, you know, really reflects the builds that our community needs um, is that uh, we then get to do some other council projects that are either too small to borrow for or fall outside the guidelines of borrowing. Um, in fact, some of the money that we're using to do our heritage program and services review program comes just from that kitty of goods. Um, wow. So the trick is to interrelate these things so that they're, um, you know, they support each other uh, through a practice of good governance. Um, and so the city of Fredericton has got some really good debt management policies and it's self-reinforcing um, because it's in council's interest to stay under the debt cap, our self-imposed debt cap, so that we get some of this, you know, juice at the end of the year to implement on smaller projects or things that, um, you know, our municipal capital borrowing board doesn't approve. So anyway, I hope that answered some of the it, it did. Of that question. It, it, it did, but it sounds place to be in for a municipality. I was gonna say it sounds like it's a challenging place to be, but it seems like the city of Fredericton has got a unique uh situation under their hands where we, we, we know how to pay it back, but if we have a little bit of extra money, we do have the ability to use that for projects that are important to the council as well. Community. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to turn to the very last segment, and this is my favorite part of this of the episode because I I'm a tourist and I like touring and I like to visit communities. So I like to find out from the people who are elected to these communities what some hidden gems are in their communities. So uh, Deputy Mayor Erickson, if I was a tourist that happens to be coming through the city of Fredericton in August this year, which I certainly am because I'm doing a tour of Atlantic Canada, what? hidden gems should I be stopping in to see while I'm in Fredericton? Well, that, that's an excellent question. And it, it, it put me to thinking um, that maybe what I ought to do is just describe a day to you uh, that you might experience as a tourist. Um, and it'll be a day that, uh, that I experienced uh, a couple weeks ago. So Saturday morning, I get up first thing in the morning. Uh, and the first thing I do uh, after a coffee, of course, is I uh, go play a round of disc golf in one of our local parks, Adele Park. Um, I'm a big got fan my of my interest golf. already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we've got a little nine hole municipal course. It's free to play in Adele Park. Um, so it'll only take you, 
you know, an hour or so to, to play around. And it's always good to do something uh, energetic in the morning to help you rationalize a bigger than appropriate weekend breakfast. So uh, I go off and I'll play a round of disc golf. Uh, Odell Park uh, is, a, is a very large urban park in the center of our city. Um, and it's a very old park. And in fact, it has within it a stand of hemlock trees. Um, and this is many, many acres of hemlock trees uh, that may be on the order of 600 years old. Um, so over the next few years, the city of Fredericton is going to be looking into whether or not this might qualify Odell Park as a UNESCO World Environmental Heritage Site, um, because it is for sure one of the oldest stands of hemlock trees um, in the Atlantic region. Um, and it may be the oldest stand of, uh, of hemlock trees on the east coast of North America. So walking through that grove is, uh, is a really interesting um, you know, local uh, phenomenon of forest bathing that you're not going to find in, in another municipality, certainly not in an urban park. Anyway, after that little half an hour walkthrough, and it's not a huge stand, you can go about the trails that are uh, that cross the area very quickly, you can go into our uh, uh, local botanic garden also shares uh, a lot of land that's adjacent to that. So if you like flowers and built gardens and some of uh, their things, you know, that's also a site available to you. After that, um, and we're probably approaching noon at this point in time. I'd recommend on a Saturday for people to go to our local farmer's market. Um, the farmer's market in Fredericton has been in, in operation for ages, uh, you know, probably many hundreds of years at this point, if not, well, probably, probably about 150 years, if I had to guess. Um, and it's the site of a variety of uh, uh, local food growers and providers, including people that do value added to foods, like taking strawberries and making them into jams, for example. Um, and a lot of these practitioners are using uh, techniques um, and using a lot of, and making a lot of choices about the stuff they sell that really represent, uh, you know, the history of some of these craft food purveyors. So you can get from, uh, uh, you know, traditional uh, prepared foodstuffs that you just don't find in our big grocery stores. Um, at the farmer's market, plus local produce, plus a lot of stuff from our artisans and from the local craft college. You know, they set up shop there to sell their stuff there. Um, and that's fantastic. Uh, right after a trip to the farmer's market, uh, I'd recommend that people go to the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. Um, so Lord Beaverbrook, um, who was one of the uh, 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 you know, supporters of developing a kind of a province-wide uh, cultural rebirth after World War II. He invested heavily in the performing arts and also art galleries and libraries and arenas and all kinds of stuff, uh, even the university system. Uh, but anyway, the Beaverbrook Art Gallery um, is a singular art gallery. It punches way above its weight. Um, in fact, we've got uh, one of the most magnificent uh, pictures ever painted by uh, Salvador Dali, the Santiago El Grande. Um, which is a remarkable piece of work to see. Um, and in fact, if you go to art galleries in, in you know, London, Rome, New York, you, know, you'll, you can often get a postcard of the Santiago El Grande in their gift shops that will say, located at the Beaverbrook Art Gallery, Fredericton, New Brunswick, on the bottom of it. Um, so why not take the opportunity to just swing by the gallery and see it and get a tour while you're here? Um, the art gallery has got a tremendous section of... Uh, uh, paintings from the Beaverbrook collection uh, that he had. And a lot of these things were gifted to the gallery upon his death. So it is a, it is a big city, world-class gallery in a small in Brunswick municipality. So that's definitely got to hit your list. Um, after that, I would recommend uh, walking our waterfront, going on the trails. Uh, one of our city trails goes across a uh, converted uh, train bridge, the Billthorpe Walking Bridge. Um, and you can do a loop of uh, the South Side Riverfront, which is the old Fredericton, and it can take you across the river uh, to do a, the North Side Riverfront. Um, and on the North Side Riverfront, um, one of the uh, first facilities you'll see um, is a, a bar and pub setup from a local company called Pickaroons. Um, and they reconverted some old buildings um, into uh, you know a pub and a restaurant, and it's right at the kind of north side hub of our trail system, at the foot of the Walking Bridge, and uh, at the juncture of trails that go 
deep into the north side and also along the riverfront. Um, and at that juncture, you know, after you've had a microbrew and, you know, wetted your whistle, you can decide to walk uh, deep into the north side to go down the trail uh, to visit Marysville. And uh, Marysville is a borough inside the city of Fredericton. Um, it's one of the only intact um, historic mill towns in Canada. Um, so a gentleman named Boss Gibson built a mill in Marysville and a bunch of mill housing. And most of that housing still exists and the mill building still exists and it's all wow. been preserved. Um, and that community itself is a national historic site um, because of that. So yeah, hop on a bike, hop on a scooter, um, just walk out to Marysville and take a look. Um, or you could uh, hop in the water and kayak up the Nashwalk River, which also gets you up to Marysville. Um, anyway, then it's uh, it's time after that to uh, consider dinner. And there's lots of restaurants and bars and uh, other things that are practicing a really interesting blend of uh, you know kind of micro gastro creation, um, while at the same time uh, you know reflecting all the good micro breweries and We've got a, a very successful and very delicious uh, cider operation in the city of Fredericton as well. Um, you know, so there's all kinds of options for dinner available. Um, and then if you're lucky, you'll be able to go into the Performing Arts Center and see a show that night, something fun. And uh, that would be, I think, a fantastic Fredericton day. Um, and the fun it thing sounds I like, like there's that day. something for everyone. Yeah, there certainly can be. Um, and... Uh, you know, if you're willing to engage and if you're willing to, uh, um, you know, get out boldly into the environment, um, you'll find things that you'd like to do. Uh, you'll find people you'd like to do them with. So there are very few people I know that come to Fredericton uh, who struggle finding something to do. Um, I, I do hear a lot. I mean, it's an interesting phenomenon. We don't have a major sports team in New Brunswick, right? Or even East Coast, right? So people around here get to pick the team they want to support. Um, so you can be a Toronto's Raptors fan or Blue Jays fan. You can be a Boston Red Sox fan or a Celtics fan or whatever. Um, but the interesting thing is that people, uh, aside from those kind of high level events, um, they can meet their needs in Fredericton socially and culturally. Um, in a variety of ways, um, but they will need periodically to travel to another city uh, to see some of that big stuff. Um, but I find that helps people put Fredericton into context, might even help them enjoy it more. I There's a lot of things that you said that I'm really excited to experience while I'm there this summer. So I'm looking I forward see. to A, seeing the art gallery because I'm a massive art gallery fan. I could spend just 24 hours oh. at an art gallery. So I'm looking you forward to it. that. Um, but I'm also looking forward to seeing these hemlock trees because 600 yeah. year old trees, this is a, this is probably a once in a lifetime experience to go see them. Well, you get to see, experience, them, experience them every day, but I would love to see them as well in person. Um, well, it's magnificent. I'd be happy to tour you through the area when you're here. Well, when I'm there, I will look you up and I will make sure that we can get a tour with the uh, deputy mayor of the city as well. So my last question for you here is this. What makes the city of Fredericton such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family, Deputy Mayor? Um, it all comes down to the people. Um, you know, the people in the city of Fredericton, we have, uh, I mean, we've got a lot of universities in the city of Fredericton. We've got a lot of cultural organizations in the city of Fredericton. Um, and our, our size um, is... It's interesting, you know, the municipality of Fredericton has a population that's just approaching 60,000 right now. Uh, but the Fredericton region, you know, our census metropolitan area, is probably approaching about 120,000 people. Um, so the uh, city um, and our police are intimately familiar with this. You know, they have to police the city as if it's a city of 100,000, right. right? Because these people are coming in to work and they're coming in to play. Um, and I think the thing that uh, impresses people about Fredericton when they get to know the community is that in, in a lot of areas, it punches well above its weight um, in terms of, you know, say cultural organizations. Uh, you know, we've discussed that at some length. Um, but also uh, when you look at the IT community, for example, in our in our community. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. A community antique community? Like, did you say antique? Oh, like no, sorry, an 
IT as an in information technology. Oh, okay. Sorry, um, I was like antique so, community. I've never heard it called that before, but okay, IT community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the IT community, uh, uh, if you go talk to any one company in the city, um, they'll know the people at the other companies. Oh, wow. Right? Um, you know, it's a small community. You get to know the, you get to know your neighbors. You get to, um, you know, in fact, uh, um, to answer the first question you asked me, you know, what got me into politics? Uh, when I was courting my wife, uh, I was uh, giving her the, her the, uh, the citizen air tour of Fredericton. We're walking down Queen Street, our main street. Um, and uh, I was saying hello to, you know, the people that I passed when I knew them. And she stopped me at one point and she said, you've said hello to the last 16 people we've walked by. And I said, well, yeah, I live in Fredericton. I know these people. I'm out. I enjoy doing things that I'm doing. And, you know, we were passing the people I know. And she's like, my hometown, we'd run you for mayor. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, if that's not an endorsement to get into politics, right I don't away. know what is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, but it's just, uh, you know, it, it's it's part of how I experience the city of Fredericton. Um, and now there are lots of caveats that go along with that. Um, one of the things that I'm very proud of that we're moving into in 2023, um, city of Fredericton has petitioned to join uh, the Canadian Coalition of Inclusive Municipalities, um, which is a uh, uh, an overarching program run by the United Nations, but it's to create more inclusive and welcoming communities. Um, and part of uh, the activities required to do this is you have to set up an anti-racism task force and you have to set up an inclusion committee and start um, uh, hearing from the marginal, the historically marginalized communities that are in your city uh, as to what makes you a more welcoming and inclusive municipality. Um, and we're walking down that road um, with the people that have stood up to serve on the racism, uh, anti-racism task force and the inclusion committee. Um, to continually ask people who are both longtime residents of Fredericton and also newcomers to our city, um, you know, how can we make our community more inclusive and better reflect what your interests are as a, as a resident here? And so I'll be proud of Fredericton if we never stop asking those kind of questions and we always keep kind of driving, you know, towards a future where things, uh, you know, are better and better reflect our vision and own understanding of what the, what our what our neighborhoods ought to be like. Well, I, I've i just known you for under about an hour and a half here, Deputy Mayor Erickson, but I can say your community is better off with you in it because you seem like you're engaged, informed, and you bring the evidence to the table that cities and municipalities often look for. So I think as long as you're there, the city of Fredericton will always grow. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for this informative, enlightening, and amazing interview i always look forward to these interviews because i always learn something about people who are elected so thank you so much for sitting down with me and talking about the issues that are facing your community but also yourself and uh, local governments oh thank you chris that's very kind of you uh, you know if we had uh opportunity for another interview i could spend as much time talking about um you know the people whose footsteps i'm following um, who are also Fredericton residents and, uh, you know, people that mentored me and, uh, you know, kind of helped create uh, the perspective that I try to operate from. We might do that. We might call you in and uh, we might call you up to the big leagues again for another ah, interview nice. later. Um, but I want to thank you once again for doing this. It's an honor and pleasure. And I want to remind everyone, as I say often, put down social media. Go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society. It helps our democracy and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. We will be back tomorrow morning with our episode with Torbay Town Councilor Trina Appleby from the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Till then, keep talking.